to be with you here today because you are a bunch of language nerds and I'm a language nerd and one of the things I love in my language life is language products. Do you like language products? <laughs> I've seen the way some of you look at language books so I think that we are in a similar kind of psychological situation most of us with relate in relationship to books um, and other learning materials. Um, I use a lot of materials. I'm not one of those people who um, roam around just talking to people and learning by osmosis. I really like to read books cover to cover. Um, and I've thought a lot about what works and what doesn't. So that is part of what I will share with you today. Now when I heard that the conference was in, in Greece last year, I was really, really happy, but then there was a part of me that was also a little bit sad because I had mapped out my entire language learning year and I hadn't left space in it for Greek and it was difficult for me to uproot my schedule. Have you ever had that kind of problem where you have a whole plan in place and then you're going someplace else and you're studying Hebrew but you're going to Italy and it just screws everything up? So I had to... Uh, and I was going to stick to my schedule, but then about three months ago, I just couldn't take it anymore because Greece is a new country for me, and I needed, I needed Greek. So I started getting books, and this is one of the books I got. And then I got these books, which are Living Language. I don't know if, you, if they sell that even here in Europe. Then Asimil. Uh, and then I decided that this was an omission in my library, so I got the colloquial. I had gotten this last year at the Polyglot Conference in New York, and then I decided I need more writing practice, so I got that Read and Write Greek book from Teach Yourself. Then um, I recovered the Glossica, which is I, some of you may know and some of you may not. It's a fairly new entry to the language learning market, so these are three books um, plus audio lessons. And then someone told me about Brian Church's book, um, Learn Greek in 25 Years. And <laughs> That didn't quite fit my timetable, but I thought, why not? So then I had the stack, and I was full of grand ambitions. I thought, if I just really focus myself and study a lot for the next three months or two and a half months, however much I had left, I can get through all those books and learn Greek, and I'm going to be in great shape when I show up and, you know, for the conference. There's something about language learning that reminds me of a small child with food. You know, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. My eyes are bigger than my brain, for sure. So, as with many of my language learning ambitions, some of it had to fall by the wayside. Um, and in fact, I just made a little graph for you, illustrating my level of, how much I finished in each of the, the materials I got. You know, that grand stack did not get fully consumed. Um, along the left-hand side, you can see 25, 50, 75, and 100%. And then the names of the things along the, uh, along the bottom. Um, I'm not fully happy because I'm not fluent in Greek. This is very disappointing to me. And the ones, if you look at the little, the shortest bars, the Rutledge, the Asimil, the Colloquial, these are the things that, that I feel could really have taken me further along my Greek lang language learning journey. So one of the things about language books is that although they are wonderful to acquire, they don't actually help you that much if you don't finish them. And, oh, I added a little thing at the end for Memrise. Um, at 12 o'clock at midnight, when I'm too tired to study grammar anymore, um, I often want to keep studying and I, can't, I just can't quite handle a book, so then I go on Memrise and I will stay there for four hours and stay up till four in the morning. So about a month and a half ago, I made a rule that I wasn't allowed to do Memrise anymore. Um, I am actually... Uh, in the throes of a we web situation, which is that I never get off the internet, and this is a problem for language learning. I don't know whether any of you who are on Facebook or other online tools have had this problem, but sometimes talking to people who love language gets in the way of language learning. So I'm trying to get off. This is me. This is what I looked like two months ago. I'm slightly better today, but I still have issues. Um, uh, this is my memorized profile. You can see I use an alias because I don't want people to know what I'm up to. It's a very good alias. No one would ever know it was me. <laughs> and, and see, the problem with this is that on this, um, I'm going to try to move this over a little bit because I'm slightly bothered by my angle. Can you still hear me if I stand here? Okay. So I have on Memrise 13,789,513 points. That is way too many points to have on Memrise. 
That means I'm on the computer for hours, not reading language books, just, I'm just on there studying vocabulary. I'm not writing, I'm not learning the language structure. I'm just acquiring vocabulary, or maybe not, depending on whether you think it works or not. And so I decided to leave the internet and go out into the world where I saw birds, I saw the sun again, I saw trees, and I began to reflect a little bit on how I learn and how a lot of people learn best, I think, which is um, less with a keyboard and more with writing, interacting, and being commun communing with books. So I think that a lot, some of my brain is in my hands, maybe more than for some of you who have grown up with computers. I grew up with handwriting and typewriters. And so when I'm studying language, I really feel a need to write. Typing a Greek word on Memrise did not begin to compare with what I acquired when I'd actually write on a paper with, um, oh, I put this here because it's totally unrelated to anything about this presentation. But <laughs> what I've noticed is if you're talking to a polyglot and there's a book nearby, they will ignore you and they'll start staring at the book. You're looking at this book now, right? You're kind of curious about it. You want to look inside. You're not studying Marathi. That has nothing to do with your life right now. But anyway, that was a decoy. OK. <laughs> here, is, here is my ancient writing implement. It is a pencil. It is a Ticonderoga number two pencil, which some of you who grew up in the United States may. I don't know how widely used these were, but this is what we always had when we were doing standardized tests and things when I was a kid. So I decided to re return more in anticipation of this presentation and also just wishing to be a better language learner again. I decided to return to the world of books and audio lessons, but let's start with the books. So. This is my library. I'm just kidding. I wish I had all that. I wish I had that many Korean, Arabic, and Romanian books, but I don't. But this is, this is, an, this is an idea that I know some of you can relate to because I've seen you in bookstores, and I, in language bookstores, and at language book parties, and I know what happens to you. It's like an animal spotting its prey. You know, the, the neck stiffens, the ability to converse stops, and, and there's just... There's just a, a, an avarice in the eyes and face of the polyglot. So um, one thing about books, there is in the world of language learning, for some products, there's a lot of attention to packaging, a lot of attention to packaging. There are some really beautiful books and language learning materials out there. They're very enticing visually. They aren't always as exciting when you open them, have you ever been disappointed by the contents of something that just looked so perfect and exciting? Um, but I think that there is a role in language learning for the seductive appearance as a starting point. And one can hope for more, but there's something special about an attractive book, isn't there? <laughs> now, if I had a child and my child were into language, I would want to buy something like this for a birthday. Because to me, this looks like candy. Does it look like candy to you? These are tiny, they're about this big, and they're flat. If you haven't seen these before, these are a series of um, dictionaries from Periplus. And um, I just find them very beautiful. Tagalog, Indonesian, all these. Now, I, I haven't even studied a number of these languages, but I saw the dictionaries, and I had to have them. <laughs> then there are these books. I'm still on the pretty book, the pretty material theme. These, okay, these are, I think these are slightly less beautiful. They aren't as candy-like, but they're enticing because they have the word dirty on the cover. So have you seen these seri the series before? Dirty Portuguese, dirty Spanish, dirty Yiddish. And then I don't know whether you can read the title of that black one, but it's black, so you know it's naughty. And the title is Hide This Italian Book. I also have Hide This French Book. I think I have Hide This Spanish. I forget, I have, I have three of them. And there's not, there's... I think it has a warning on the front, like about, you know, salacious material. So these kinds of books, and here are, some, here are some phrase books, which I know some of you are fans of. I am not, but if someone gave me a phrase book for my birthday, just, you know, my birthday's coming up, just so you know. Um, if someone gave me a phrase book for my birthday, even though I don't really like using them, I would be out of my mind with joy. And the more esoteric the language, probably the more joyous I would be. 
Does anyone recognize the little Langenscheid Deutsch uh, English Dictionary? Do you know where? Do you know where I got this? It was at the Polyglot Gathering of 2014, I think. Now, to show you how small and cute and adorable and desirable these books are, I put an almond in the middle. Can you see that? <laughs> That's to show you scale. So I don't find these books particularly helpful, but I enjoy them. And there's something about just the language lust that they inspire that I find valuable. But now we are getting to the world of beautiful books, the combination of beauty and intelligence where there's really some profound, there's some profound stuff in these books from, do you know where these are from? You recognize these? Where are they from? Routledge, yes. So on the left, we have the modern Spanish grammar. We have Swedish in the middle. On the right, I haven't touched this one yet. This is relatively new, I think. This is the Swahili grammar and workbook. Pretty sexy, right? <laughs> so these are, when I go to trade shows and these are laid out on a table, I completely freak out. I can hardly, I, I leave and I go to other tables and then I come back, because visually, it's like, again, it's like the candy thing. Um, as many of you know, product quality and marketing quality are very poorly correlated in language learning. Um, I'm not a product marketer generally, but I would say that I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the world of language publishing and I'm also pretty familiar with the, the world of language marketing language product marketing. And I find the correlation between the marketing quality and the product quality to be extraordinarily poor, unbelievably poor. So you can have a great material advertised in the worst possible way and vice versa. Sometimes the marketing quality is good and the product is good. But anyway, I drew a graph of what I've observed. You can see there are dots all over the place because the correlation is so poor. And the reason I make this point is that it's very important not to get deterred or encouraged by what they promise you will happen. Um, <laughs> all right, so some of the lingualers that I've encountered speak French in five minutes, acquire a new language painlessly, and without the smallest sign, you have learned a thing. Learn Italian because of me, a random woman with enchanting décolletage. <laughs> La and lastly, our product kind of sucks, but man did we spend a lot on packaging. <laughs> oh, I don't know how this picture got here. <laughs> this is so weird that it showed up after the last slide. One of the things that tortures me as a person interested in language learning and interested in promoting language learning in the United States, which is not famous for the interest in language learning, um, this, is a, this is a plague upon my efforts. I teach, for, for, as some of you know, for a living, I, I teach communication skills at businesses. So I go in, um, and in English, I'm not teaching foreign language communication skills, but I teach communication skills. And I sometimes give talks to, um, at, at my client companies about how their employees can learn languages on their own. Now, in many cases, the company these days has invested in Rosetta Stone and made it available to its employees for free. What happens when you take an expensive product like Rosetta Stone and make it available to a community for free? That means that no matter how much you tell them about other products that are better, they won't go and buy them because they would have to spend money and they're getting a $300 product or whatever it costs nowadays for free, so they think that's a good deal. So what this has done is put a brick wall between a lot of people in language learning, strangely, right? Because it's so well known and um, it seems like it should encourage it, but I actually find that it makes people less willing to try new things. And that's one of the inspirations for uh, this theme for me. I just love products so much, and I, I would like to see more of the more esoteric or less well-known ones have a chance against this bright yellow packaging. In, even in the seven years since I, I returned to hardcore language learning in 2009 after a 19-year hi hiatus roughly from it. And one of the things that even since I returned to it has changed, one of the things that has changed is the ubiquity of audio files. It's so easy to get great audio quality now for language learning and that for me makes a huge difference. Now I'm not talking about audio files where you read a dialogue and you hear it at the same time. I do not find it interesting to read a dialogue and hear it at the same time and then read the dialogue again and hear it at the same time. That doesn't engage me, it doesn't help me speak better. What I'm talking about 
is um, the availability, um, the easy availability of MP3s or whatever newfangled technology some of you are using that I don't know about yet, but the fact that you can just go online and download audio files um, seems to be encouraging more product development in this regard. And as sound travels the world, for me, this seems to be a really transforming experience in language learning. You're not listening to a few sound files and um, on a, or, or you don't have an audio cassette or a CD with a, a few sound, sound bites and a book. You can listen to audio endlessly. And one of the, the products that I'm actually, I'm not an affiliate of any product company, by the way, and I'm trying to be very careful about that here, but I'm extremely enthusiastic about a product like Glossica, which I've, I have a lot of Glossica because they had a big sale last year and I, I went a little crazy. I'm not really, I'm not into shoes. That's not my thing. This is my thing. So, and the thing is they have all this stuff for languages that I've had trouble sourcing material for. So along with each of the three books, if you don't know this product, they have um, tons of audio files. I mean, you could, you could spend months doing this, months and months. So it's a ton of material. Now on the upper right, for example, is Polish. This is very exciting to me because when I studied Polish back in 2010 maybe, I could get 30 Pimsleur lessons. What can you learn in 30 Pimsleur lessons? I learned that I can learn not very much. I read a whole bunch of grammar. I learned that there are a lot of ways to say to in Polish. Um, but I didn't have enough audio and I felt so hungry for it. This, when I return to Polish, will satisfy my hunger. Same thing for Dutch. It was hard to find enough audio material. Um, Dutch people um, inconveniently speak a lot of English, and I find that the <laughs> demand in the other direction doesn't produce a huge amount of quantity. So, um, anyway, this is an obs Does anyone remember vocabulary? Most people hate vocabulary. I like it because it, it's lists of um, vocabulary, and I just like to have a chance to hear and reproduce each word at a time. So it will give you English and then the target language, and then it will reverse it. So I'm very excited about this. This is me. Um, <laughs> this is me doing a Pimsleur Hindi lesson. I love Pimsleur. I'm, I'm, I'm probably Pimsleur's biggest fan. They don't love me as much as I love them, but I love them a lot. This is me doing a Pimsleur Hindi lesson in my living room. This is a Korean hula hoop. I feel it's important to mention that. Um, it, had, it had little bumps on the inside that, uh, that, that were magnetized or something. It was supposed to make me incredibly healthy. Um, it was very painful, but, I, st but I, I was very determined to do a whole 30-minute Pimsleur lesson with a hula hoop, so that's what I did. And this is me doing it, looking happy, um, and I, I, didn't, I didn't drop the hula hoop the entire time. This is what I do every night when I go to sleep. I have an extremely tolerant husband who doesn't freak out about this, but um, for the last two and a half years, there's been exactly one night that I haven't gone to sleep with some kind of audio lesson. Sexy, right? <laughs> Um, this is the kind of stuff, okay, right up on the, on the board right now, I, on the screen, are a bunch of books that I haven't looked at, except the cover. <laughs> I kind of flipped through. Do you have any books like that on your shelves? Okay, you know the feeling. So I feel guilty about that, but I'm putting these up here because this is the kind of thing that makes my heart beat faster when I go to a, a book expo, which I'm going to do in Boston next month, and they will have tons of materials there like this, and I can drool over this. And um, these are from Georgetown University Press, which I mentioned because I think um, they do a nice job of covering some languages also that I've had trouble getting materials for in the past. This is, um, you know the world of self-publishing in language learning? For me, this is a very interesting development because I'm a big fan of publishing houses with reputations and editors and things like that. I tend to favor those. But every once in a while, I find um, in the world of self-publishing or very small publishing houses, I find new materials that aren't well known that really get me excited. The books around the edge um, from the, uh, the bigger ones, the, the purple and blue and red ones, are from a place called Bahar Books. They publish, per, uh, it's a small publishing house. It's almost a one-woman show. I mean, she's a crazily productive woman in, I believe, White Plains, New York, so not very far from me. Um, and she produces, these just keep popping out, like one after the other. And I really like them because they pay a lot of attention to how the learner thinks, at least this learner. 
um, the books at the top, the two little ones. I wonder whether any of you have seen these. It was also, a, a, I think, an independent publishing job. Um, Arabic grammar un unraveled. Oh, that's interesting. And write it in Arabic. And I found them. They weren't edited um, in the same way that some other books I had. There were a couple of mistakes in the English here and there, or, and the format wasn't quite you know, everything it might have been. But they were very friendly to me, the learner. And so I like the competition that's being offered by self-publishing. This I posted on Facebook. I don't know if any of you remember this. I was very excited by this book. Also a small, I think, self-publishing kind of situation. Look at, it has 101 Pashto verbs. This is exciting. I love books that have um, grammatical terms on the cover. They just, I don't know, it's kind of a turn on. And I was very excited to be getting 101 Pashto verbs. And then I opened it. Are you able to see the problem here? What's the problem? It's backwards, as often happens when you have a left-to-right language and a right-to-left language on the same screen. So in the table of contents for this wonderful verb book, I, had, I already was seeing everything backwards and separated, which is a depressing beginning, even though the rest of the book was OK. This is, this is the kind of thing that happens when you take chances on unknown publishers. I think it, this is a good moment for us to have a small memorial service for the paper dictionary. This is something that I still occasionally buy but never use. Have others of you found yourselves in the same situation that pretty much it's an internet kind of thing now? Um, so um, I made a little memorial in my living room. <laughs> These are, these are books that I enjoy looking at on my shelf but that I actually never open because they're so heavy. And, and the slang dictionary at the bottom, which is my favorite, resides up on a really high up shelf that I can't really reach. So I look at it and I admire it, but I don't use it. But I still think that there's something to be said for the mere inspiration that a beautiful large old book like this gives you. The other thing that I thought we could have a small memorial for is the verb table book. Those also seem to be dying as people have options on, on, um, online instead. Does anyone still use paper flashcards? You do? I do too. <laughs> we, should talk, we should talk after. No matter, <laughs> no matter how, I do love Memorize website, but no matter how often, how much I use it, I can't help thinking that the olden days where I could just get rid of words that I, I had learned and be done with them and decide for myself when I was done with them as opposed to having a technological system decide it for me. I kind of miss those days. So I still have these on my shelf and I'm pretty excited about them. I mentioned earlier that I don't just learn by absorbing things. I don't just go around and randomly pick up things. If I don't actually sit down with books and audio lessons, I won't learn anything. So this is my, this is, I'm not really an artist. Um, this is my system in the middle. You'll see that it, it's imperfect. And there's me at the top getting dumped in with my audio lessons and a bunch of books. And then if you shake it, then I come out the other end eventually um, having acquired one more language, N plus one, as opposed to the original one. Um, I like to have, as you saw from the opening pictures, it's so hard to pick and focus that I, liked, I just like to have a lot of materials. I know that there are some of you in this room who feel the same way. Is that, is that the case? One book is never enough for you to study? Okay, I see, some, I see some nods and I see some shaking of heads, so I'm not sure what that means. But, um, but you know, when you have a class, you can ask the, the human in front of you a question when you have a problem. When you're looking at one book and suddenly the explanation goes awry, there's no one to ask. So my version of asking the teacher is to ask the next book. So I as soon as I hit an impasse in one book, I run around to the next. Um, this is, this is um, an, uh, I'm paying homage here to the to ex grammatical exercise, grammar exercises. <laughs> I don't know if these are sold in Europe. They are. Now, I don't hear about these very much in the polyglot community, and maybe during the, the, the questions, someone can tell me why that is. Um, I like these because the ratio of practice to explanation is very high, and that is something that I look for in the books that I use. It's nice to read, but I really need to do. I need to write, I need to check my answers, I need to see if they're right or wrong, and then I need to try again. 
The one on the very far right um, has a very peculiar name. I don't know if you've seen these series. They're the Everything series, and I think they teach you how to do everything from, I don't know, fixing a car to learning a language. And the names are ridiculous. The Everything Brazilian Portuguese Practice Book. What the hell does that mean? Um, but it has so many exercises. I mean, if you, like, if you like grammar exercises, it's the best. This is what my books look like. I write all over them. Here are some of my Persian materials, one in Italian, one in German, one in French. I know some of you like to do this too. I'm gonna whiz through this. Now I wanna complain. And what I wanna complain about, is, this is a table of contents from a Portuguese um, language book. And I just, since I'm not sure you all can read it, I wanna read a small selection. Chapter 23 is about ill health, getting a cold. Chapter 24, time, opening and closing times. Um, chapter 25, people, talking about families. 26, eating out, ordering a meal for two. This one killed me. 27, accommodations, checking into a campsite reservation. <laughs> when I order a book and I see a table of contents like this, I get very sad. To me, this is the most boring way to engage language learners and to study. And maybe some of you feel different about this, but all of these things are very tourist-heavy kinds of activities. And what I generally find is that when you do a tourist-heavy activity, there's a lot of English spoken, and you don't need this stuff. So I want to be able to discuss the other stuff. Now, this is, I don't know how you're going to feel about this. This is my ideal kind of um, <laughs> table of contents. <laughs> Noun genders and adjective agreement. <laughs> nouns and adjectives in the plural. Plural of men nouns and adjectives. This is, this is what I call a hot table of contents. This was, for <laughs> this was for a Polish book. And I don't, this might be Routledge, I don't remember. But for me, this is how I want to approach a language. Um, one thing I really hate is when I get stuck in dialogues dealing with some set of people that I didn't care about in the first dialogue and I still have to be hearing about them 20 dialogues later. Do you know what I'm talking about? I've seen, I've seen this. So, you know, you get introduced to some family and it's, you have to move in with them. And I never liked them to begin with. So this is, and often they're doing things like exchanging currency or signing up for a class at a local university or doing something that, you know, I really, it, it's not really why I want to study the language. So here's Hugo, a foreign exchange student who loves soccer. This is Anna, his girlfriend. She likes math and wants to be a doctor. There are lots of exclamation points because that's the, the chirpy, chipper kind of tone of some of these things. Mrs. Schmidt is their teacher. She comes from Austria. Um, <laughs> so what I, what I think needs to happen, <laughs> what I think needs to happen is we need to sex it up a bit. All right? So, I mean, you know sex sells, right? So, now this is from Barron's, and I don't usually use Barron's that much, but this made an impression on me. Uh, Yo siempre me ducho con agua fría, así me pongo fuerte contra la gripe. Now, this is translated. Look, the guys try not to be modest there. This is translated, just in case you can't see this translation. I always shower with cold water. And then, number two, that way I harden myself against the flu. Did they really not know what they were doing there? <laughs> so I've, I decided to re, reimagine Hugo, meet Hugo, who watches porn online nine hours each day. This is Anna, his girlfriend. She is three months pregnant with Mrs. Schmidt's son's baby. Mrs. Schmidt just embezzled money from her book club to buy wine. This is the thing about stuff like this. You can't please everyone all the time. This is the kind of language book that would really capture my imagination. And I'm picturing a whole series um, full of these um, sinning types of characters. And I think that would be a lot more fun. OK, I want to make sure we have, mm -hmm -hmm. this is the bane of my existence. I want this to stop. So I'm not picking on Hippocrene in particular, because a lot of products still have CDs. Is this? Do you have a CD player, um, a DVD player in your computer? So I have a floating one, and I'm messy, 
So whenever I get a DVD, it takes me about two weeks to find the DVD player, and by that time I'm already on lesson 20, and I don't care about the audio anymore. So I'm hoping that we'll get out of this phase of language learning pretty soon so we can move on to something more modern. Um, now I want to just bitch a little, oops, am I allowed to say that word? Okay, I want to bitch a little bit about just tiny details that really get to me. You know the books where the binding is so tight that you can't open it? And your entire undertaking with the book is spent trying to pry it open. And this just makes me, it, it's really hard for me to keep using this thing. Binding is a big issue. See, see what happens there with the text? Everything you need to know is here. <laughs> this is a book where the answer key is conveniently put online for you, so you can look at the internet and find out the answers to all the exercises you're doing. I hate this. This is, oh, and look, they said, they're talking about how the portability, always anywhere you happen to be, I'm not on the internet. I'm on the book. I'm in a book, and I want someone to tell me whether I did something right. Now, if, they don't, if the answer key is in the back, you have to flip back and forth. Have you ever noticed this? And often the thing is laid out very, um, very unpleasantly without labels, without chapter numbers, and you just really, it's hard to keep track. So I have done a little mathematical calculation of the number of times I flipped back and forth to the answer key in my language books. I just made up that number, I have no idea. That's probably too high. Uh, times ne so 912 books times 92 exercises per book times 19 flips per exercise equals 1,594,176 flips from the exercise to the back of the book. <laughs> Living language um, solved this problem by putting the answers at the bottom. And my dream for the coming years is that more publishers will do this more consistently. It, makes, it actually speeds this up so much for me. Here's a font size challenge. Any of you have studied Arabic? So the font size, this is what happens. The publisher has a native speaker involved in these books. And they, the, the publisher looks at the native speaker's book and says, are you, I mean, I actually know this happened with a publisher. The, the, and I won't name the publisher, but the, the publisher asks the native speaker writer, um, the font size seems a little bit small on the Arabic, is it okay? And then the native speaker says, yes, it's fantastic. Have any of you tried to study Persian or Arabic and, and just found that it looks microscopic? I have books that I just haven't been able to use. Now that I've studied, I've practiced a long time, now I can see them, but I actually think this is an issue that deters people from studying this language. So it's sort of an obsession of mine. Oh, there's the magnifying glass. I bought a full page magnifying glass to put over a book. But it's very tiring to do things that way. I love these fill in the blank exercises where they're like, 23 words and 19 blanks, and you have no idea what the excerpt is about, so you spend the entire time trying to figure out what the story could possibly be about and what word to put in what blank. Any time that I'm spending time trying to grasp what's happening and I'm not learning the language, I, am, I grow increasingly resentful. I'm filled with resentment. I'm especially filled with resentment when I find errors and I tell the publisher about it and the publisher doesn't care. Publishers should care. They should not be indifferent to errors. Hi, I found 21 errors in 10 pages, including a verb table that mislabeled all the subjunctive forms as conditional. Then the publisher says, thank you for your interest in our product. We hope you are enjoying it. <laughs> there, are, there are exceptions to this, for sure. I find some publishers are incredibly interested in collecting errors and fixing the mistakes. And to me, this is a commitment to the language learning community that really builds a connection with the internet and with easy reporting now. I think that makes a huge difference and is a very exciting way actually for publishers and users to bond, to become one, and for publishers to get greater allegiance. This is what some of the beginnings of my books look like where I mark all the errors. This is actually from a book that I used to study Greek and I found mistakes both in the text and in the error in the answer key. Um, I'm almost at a close here. You know this whole concept of trying to make language learning fun? Is it always fun? It's not always fun. And products that seek to make, them, to make this undertaking always fun and to do it in artificial ways, you know, with people like my enthusiastic student with the teacher, Mrs. Schmidt from Austria and all that stuff, that doesn't really help me. 
um, making a video game where I get to shoot all the verbs or something like that, that doesn't really help me learn. It might be fun in the moment, but it doesn't really help me acquire languages. And one thing, what, I have a kind of working theory that the more fun the product gets, it, either I flatline, I don't, it doesn't really make me learn more, it doesn't improve my fluency, or actually this starts to happen. I start getting click happy, I'm jumping all over the internet, I'm doing all kinds of stuff, and I'm not really learning anything. Effectiveness is the key, and that's always a difficult thing to define, but that's what I hope I developed a tiny bit in some of the comments that I made. And this is, you know, if you have a good product, you can really learn a lot. I love my husband so much because he helped me put these bookcases together so that I could al alphabetize from Albanian to Zulu. This was a couple months ago, and I'm still, I'm really in love. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do is to lie there and read a language book with the other ones around me. And I think those of you who, who know and love products will really understand that, that sensation. I've left 10 minutes for comments and questions. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your, your grievances. And um, I think we have a microphone in case, uh, in case any of you want to comment. Hello. Oh, wow. God. Okay. Yeah, you don't, you don't need to hold it very close to your mouth. I don't really even need it. Um, but anyway, it's here. Do you, um, do you buy most of these products online? Is that, I'm just was trying to work out that, was it Pashto or something where it was all backwards? How, did, how, does that, how, how do you get surprised? That one I bought online. Um, but I, I do get a lot of them at, at expos, at trade shows. Um, usually I know a little better what I'm getting into. <laughs> Some of those I acquired from Hippocrini when they were downsizing and they were ha I hauled them across town in a suitcase from their, their building to my apartment. So I think that we have to make a case for a good kind of fun and one idea for example that I would contribute a uh, crossword puzzles. I kind of enjoy having crossword puzzles for vocabulary in the in the books. Can you think of other things that are good kind of fun? It's interesting about the crossword puzzles because I personally hate doing those. Um, but I think it's a very personal thing. Um, my idea of fun is that Polish table of contents that I showed you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Absolutely fantastic material. Uh, my name is Helena Badzi, and I'm oh, a Oh, hello. I know your name. Hello. I'm a polyglot of 19 languages and survival of all that. And my bookcase actually spans two continents and three houses, and it gets... <laughs> Big thing. Collect those because life is long. I collected Farsi that one day, if I live long enough, I will use. Then you will not find these books. A lot of these books are evanescent. Collect them while you can. When the moment comes for you to learn those languages, you will have them. Very important. Um, and a lot of this stuff is not easily available. You see, you show things that I have not seen, publishers that I have not seen. One thing I did not hear you hear, talk about is the free Foreign Service Institute courses. Mm. Every one of you who wants a free, very detailed material, uh, log on, uh, Google Foreign Service Institute, yogic.eu, and you will have what they were doing in the 60s. See, All of this material, very boring, quote unquote, for you young people. I worked at the World Bank for 27 years. <laughs> I had to get up to speed to talk educationally. And yes, you have to go through all of these, you know, silly tourist stories. And you've got to get to a goal of being able to converse in Malagash, which I had to do this January, on educational material. You've got to get through the stuff. And you've got to mind the small units, by the way. The grammar, as you very well corrected. But do, for all of you, look for those free Foreign Service Institute. There's also the Defense Language Institute free materials. Uh, with audio that was digitized and to which I all and other volunteers contribute also. Thanks. With um, much respect to your language history, which I've read about online, 
Um, I have two challenges with material like that. One is that I have a personal reluctance to use any materials that um, don't include the word internet in them, you know, somewhere. <laughs> because I, I feel language change, language changes, and I, I, I want to make sure that I'm speaking in a, in a way that's current. But I also have a secondary consideration, which is that I review products for my website, and um, I prefer to review things that are actually in print, because I want people to be able to find them. I've had a little trouble myself. I've looked at the material, those materials online, and I think they're an important um, tool. I, I'm not that young, and I find it a little hard sometimes to engage with them the way I do with more modern things. Um, hi, Ellen. Um, thank you very much for being at this conference. Um, I wanted to thank ask- Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask another question about the, uh, the fun aspect. Yes. Fluency to fun. Um, considering that the uh, product in language learning is becoming uh, was has been a little bit outdated for some of the stuff that's that's out there. How do you feel about the new products such as like these apps like Duolingo and Memorize, which try to make the process of language learning fun, yet a little bit counteract the the graph? I personally haven't tried it, but I've heard great things from. From other people. Well, I've used I've used memorize a lot. It's I have a problem. I have a memorized problem, and the first step to conquering it is to admit it. Um, but I, based on the amount of time that I put into it, I don't see the return on the way out. Um, I enjoy it. I use memorize a lot to help familiarize myself, um, to to help become familiar with um, unfamiliar scripts. That's what I find it the most useful for. Especially I use, I used it a lot with Arabic. Um, so that I could read faster, because I wanted to be able to glance at a page and be able to recognize words, and I found that to take me a long time. Um, Duolingo, uh, I see a lot of excitement about Duolingo. I personally, I just don't really engage that much with the computer, and um, I do like it better than Rosetta Stone, actually, which I've tested for hundreds of hours um, and found not very satisfying. Um, but, I, but I just can't get into it the same way I can get into the systematic instruction that you get in a book combined with audio lessons and just hardcore vocabulary work. Oh, hi. Here. Hi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you did actually just kind of answer part of my question, so I'm, because it was about Memorize as well, where you said that when you were in, in <coughs> sorry, in the middle of your It's talk, emotional, isn't it? <laughs> In the middle of your talk, you said that uh, you know you spend all this time, all this time, and, and you don't feel like you're learning anything when you're spending this. Not time. Not nothing. I'm not. Okay. I'm learning something. But that you you had to you know put a cap on it because you were having all this fun, but you didn't feel like it was paying back for you. And I don't know, one thing that I often feel like I struggle with the most in language learning is the vocabulary, where I. I love grammar and it really makes sense to me and so I get it all and then I'm like, wait a minute, I only know how to say cat and dog and plate. And <laughs> Aren't so I those just, like, the I... critical words? I, if I don't know cat and dog, I don't feel complete. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I guess one thing was the vocabulary where it's, I mean, do you, your orgasmic table of contents there was, you know, it was a grammar thing. <laughs> And so I guess, I, is, do you just find that you spend more of your time on the grammar and that you don't like to focus on the vocabulary? I, is I that generally what the issue have three, was there? I have three prongs generally, the audio lessons, the grammar, and then vocabulary, however I go about it, which I used to do with paper or flashcards. And I'm thinking just because, um, as some of you know, I'm on the computer way too much. I need to get off the computer. I'm thinking of returning to paper flashcards, which I, I used prolifically for Italian, and I found extremely effective. I mean, I really acquired a lot of vocabulary. Um, I wrote them all out by hand, you know, and, and, and I love that. But for me, that's a very important part. If I just do something like Pimsleur and grammar, then I can't really talk. How, do we need to stop, Alex? Uh, you know. You know? <laughs> Thank you very much, Helen. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>